Hi, Helen, Hi. how are you? Um, Helen, I'm confused. Are you Helen Stooks or are you Helen O'Hara? Well, Helen O'Hara is my stage name. It was the name given to me by Kevin Rowland when I first joined Dexys. And I've always kept it as my professional name. Stooks is a married name, except I'm not married anymore. So, ah, okay. <laughs> so I've actually collected a lot of names over my lifetime, but Helen O'Hara is is the musician. It's 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 me actually. I right. actually feel it's me. <laughs> and, and why did he give you that as a stage name? He didn't like Stooks. Um, I wasn't Stooks then. I was Bevington then. Right. <laughs> and he, so, he so didn't I, like that. Well, what he did is he Kevin put. Um, the Emerald Express together, which was three violins, a violin section of three fiddles for two IA. And he called us the Emerald Express and he gave us all um, new names. Um, he, he's very theatrical, Kevin. Um, in fact, he gave a lot of the band new names. So I was Helen Nahara in the Emerald Express. One of the other fiddle players was Steve Brennan, so all Irish names. And the other one was Roger McDuff. And the guitarist in the group was called Kevin Adams, but he didn't really want two Kevins in the group, so he renamed him Billy Adams. Um, the bass player became Giorgio Kilkenny, Irish, Italian. He was actually Mick Gallic. And so Kevin created this um, wonderful sort of theatrical um, group. Um, we, we, was, we all had these sort of new identities, um, which, which kind of just coloured everything. It, it, it made everything... Um, must have been, must have made it quite just, surreal. Yeah, yeah it, but, but it felt very natural as well because Kevin, you know, he choreogra um, choreographies the show, um, you know, so we, we always, there's always lots of staged movements. So, it, and he, his lyrics are, are, are very, you know, he's a storyteller. Um, it, it, it never felt odd, to be honest. Really? No, and, no, no, nobody minded at all. Everyone just went along with it and thought, yeah, this is a great idea. Yeah, I didn't see anybody anybody mind at all. Uh, it, it, it just felt right. And I actually love the name Helen O'Hara. I think it sounds very romantic. And um, well, I think quite, well, quite like another of identity. Scarlett O'Hara, right? Yeah, Reminded exactly. you of that. <laughs> exactly. And it's it's far cooler than Bevington, you know. <laughs> so, oh, I don't know. Bevington sounds well, just yeah. fine to me. Well, okay. it's fine. It's fine, but it but it's kind of quite nice, and it's also also quite useful actually to have two names sometimes. Sometimes it's confusing with passports and yeah, um, you know, legal things, and other times it's um, it's just nice to have this other persona, you know. So I'm very happy. <laughs> so you so you actually have all your documentation in in both names. Um, sort of, yes. I right. mean, legal stuff is all is all Stooks. Yeah. Um, but you know, sometimes when I'm on tour with whoever it might be, you get to a hotel and you, it's like, I wonder which name it's got. I'm going to be under. You know. <laughs> I, I've got I've got a similar thing going because although I'm no longer married, I kept my married name for the sake of the kids, and yes. I've always Same. worked in my maiden name as Sandy K. Right. So. I'm, I, I can completely understand what you're saying. I get places and gosh, well, who am I today? Or someone says, well, uh, yeah. you know, what did you book in as? It's like, mm, I can't actually remember. I'm either this or I'm that. So oh, exactly. I'm, I'm, so yeah. I'm, I'm meeting yeah. a fellow two-person person. person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and that's fine. You kind of get used to it, don't you? <laughs> yes. Well, Helen, whatever you want to call yourself at the, as, as a last name, um, can you walk us through all the steps that uh, that came to be for you to join Dexys. I, I believe that you started off life knowing at nine years of age that you wanted to be a violinist, which is incredible. That's right. Yes. Yeah, so, um, as soon as I heard my sister Jenny play the violin and there was an opportunity at school to, to learn, I put my hand up, said, yes, please, love to play. And as soon as I picked the violin up, I sort of knew that that is what I wanted to do. Um, but I had this, so I had a very classical upbringing, but I came from a, a big family of, of seven children and I'm one of the youngest. And there was a lot of pop music being played in the house. And that was always my first love. As much as I love classical music, it was the excitement. It was the three minute song and the Rolling Stones that, that caught my heart, you know, really. really um, and I, 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 I wanted to be in a band 
from a very early age, but the violin, you know, I thought, well, you know, obviously it's not electric guitar, it's not drums or anything, how would it fit? When I was 17, um, I saw an advert in a local paper for a pop group wanting musicians to join. Any instruments, they said. Uh -huh. So I, I wrote myself and, and uh, my best friend who played viola, we, we applied and basically got the job um, with, um, it was a band that had been formed by a group, um, the drummer from the Grand Hawks, who, who were a very well-known um, three-piece, very heavy rock progressive group in the 70s, led uh -huh. by a guy called Tony McPhee. And Ken Postelnik, the drummer, had put, he'd left the Groundhogs and he'd put this instrumental prog rock group together. We joined, and that was my introduction and my way into pop music. From there, I then joined another group, but on keyboards this time, a sort of soul group, which then morphed into a new wave punk group. And then that group, that group did very well in terms of we, we gigged a lot, we won a lot of competitions, we, we made a single with the BBC, we won, you know, it, it, we were doing very well, but nobody signed us, no record company signed us, and we felt we'd gone as far as we could. And my sister Liz said to me, I was at a, I was at a loose end, I, I didn't really know where to go from here, and she said, well, why don't you go to music college and, you know, spend a few years there developing you know, yourself as a violinist. And I thought, do you know what? That sounds a really good idea. I applied to Birmingham, the Birmingham Conservatoire, got a place there, felt that I was probably now going in a classical direction. At the end of my four years, I, I was auditioning for orchestras. I got a job with the Bilbao Symphony Orchestra. But at the same time, um, an ex-member of Dex's, Kevin Archer, had left Dex's. He'd formed a new, great, new group called the Blue Ox Babes. He came to the college looking for violinists to play on his demos, found me, I played on them. He played those demos to Kevin Rowland from Dex's. Kevin Rowland then asked me to play on his demos. And basically from there, you I joined in. Dex's. I was in, I was at the end of my degree. It, this was all just before Come On Eileen became a hit. I recorded to Raya with the band when I was still at college. I had this dilemma of a secure job with a Spanish symphony orchestra or joining Dexys who had no money at the time, they were broke. If Come On Eileen wasn't going to be a hit, the band would probably break up. But something in my heart said, this, this is it. The, you know, the, this band is very special. Kevin Rowland is very special. Um, and I thought, you know what, even if the band was to not make it, I've st I can still play the violin. I can still find something else. I can maybe join another orchestra, another group. But a few weeks later, Come Eileen went to number one. I sure and did. from there, so you, <laughs> it you was magic. You definitely pulled the right rein, didn't you? But I can imagine that your parents must have been really upset with you. From the age of 17, you were already heading <laughs> off in a direction that they, I'm, I'm positive, didn't condone. You could say that. Actually, my parents had split up when I was a teenager, when I was 13. My mum had quite a difficult time with me because I was a very strong-willed, <laughs> um, became a very rebellious teenager. And yes, she, she really, I suppose she was just worried for me. You know, I was yeah. joining a progressive rock group. Yeah, she um, wanted you to have a future. 17, yeah, exactly. I mean, it totally understandable you know sex drugs or rock and roll not not great you know <laughs> um however um so so yes yeah, so, so so then when I went to music college she she thought great you know Helen's now <laughs> seen the light she settled down when I rang her to tell her that I I wasn't going to join the orchestra and I was joining Dex's she was so upset. She was just, imagine. she was beside herself because, you know, you can imagine she thought that she'd got me back on the straight and narrow as it were. And, um, but then of course, once I was on top of the pops, you know, she was, she was over the moon. And, well, um, she, was, she, was she really proud of yeah. you then? She was really proud of me. Yeah, yeah, she really was. And she met Kevin and she really liked Kevin, you know, and, and, she, she saw that I was really happy in doing what I was doing. And I think she then understood that 
you know if you have determination and and you 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 have a talent and you know you're you'll be okay you know what I mean it's like you know life is all ups and downs and we all have to make choices and um yeah it yeah you certainly made your choices didn't you so just to back up a little bit you played on the on the recording of two Raya. that's right yes I, I I played on all the songs I was leading a double life really when I was at college so I you know one minute I was having violin lessons and leading the college orchestra you know then I was was in the studio with uh, Dexys recording the whole of two Raya. um it, but I mean you know I was in my 20s you know Huh? had the what, energy what, to, to to do that <laughs> of course what, what, how did that experience feel for you I mean this was obviously before we got to come on Eileen but you must have been yeah. swept away with the with the fact that you were even helping make music for this rock group that's right I mean it was the songs well, when I walked into Dex's um, rehearsal studio the very first time I was something just blew me away there was I, I didn't even have to think about it I knew I was with a very special band who had the discipline and the and the same approach to classical music um you know they they worked really hard they get their attention to detail Kevin was an amazing leader he still is he he everybody worked really hard everyone had the same vision it was like I had found my dream group um mm -hmm. Everybody was totally dedicated, serious, you know, nobody took drugs, nobody drank. <laughs> it was like totally um, dedicated 100%. to the music. Dedicated to the music, yeah. And but I mean, you know, it's still fun to be with. Yeah. It well, it wasn't like it was um, you know, it wasn't fun fun to be in, but but it was it was the approach and the songs particularly that blew me away. Um and, and the musicianship from the band so so I, I'd sort of walked into this perfect dream group really mm -hmm. and um, there was never any I never had any doubt that you know is where I felt I belonged I just right. was anybody you know, else classically trained yes um, Jim Jim Patterson who co-wrote the songs with Kevin on trombone he studied at Leeds College of Music um, he was classically trained. Um, the two other fiddle players in the Emerald Express, who I'd asked to join the band for, for Kevin, um, they were obviously music students with me. Uh -huh. um, a few of the band were, were classically trained, but hadn't been to music college. And the, the other half of the band, like, like the drummer and um, Billy Adams, the guitarist, were self-taught like Kevin. So it was yeah. a really good mix, a really good mix of um, people who had the freedom to think without any any inverted commas rules yeah. uh, that they'd learned uh, and those who had the the classical knowledge which was also very useful for Kevin as well. All right so after 2RIA that you, you'd completed that whole album and you actually joined the band um, as and uh, you 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 actually Sorry, I'll just do that bit again. You actually joined the band and then made Come On Eileen, which uh, spent 17 weeks in the UK charts, four of which were at number one. Were you surprised by that? Um, I, I think the success of the songs to me were always there. The, the quality, the, the fact, I always felt the band deserved that expect, that, that sorry. I always felt the band deserved the success, right. but to get to number one is sort of beyond your dreams, really. You know, you'd, I'd never imagined that we'd be number one. Um, it, it's a weird thing. I, I, I felt more um, dedicated to the music and the group than, than thinking about the, the sort of media success of having a number one single, if you know what I mean. But when it did happen, it, it, it was just amazing because then you felt that Texas were getting the success that they deserved. They'd had a struggle, you know, to, to, to get there because of lack of money and um, just that, that sort of, uh, not luck, because I, I think we all make our own luck to a certain extent, but, but, but there is basically what happened with Kamen Aline is that, um, 
one of the pluggers was Oda Radio Play, and Come and Eileen was played on um, uh, Radio One, and that helped. That play helped push it up the charts, and from there we got more plays and ended up on top of the pops. And then, you know, the wheels started turning, and and because it was such a great song, it then took off. Right. But if that play hadn't have happened, you know, it's that thing in life, isn't it? The chance. I mean, yeah. sliding doors. Although the sliding doors, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, <laughs> so what impact did hitting number one have on all of your lives? How did it change your lives? Well, I still remained in my student flat. I didn't, um, you know, I didn't move out. I just sort of didn't have time really to look, look for anywhere else. Um, we, was, we were incredibly busy. Everybody wanted us, you know, to, to do interviews and be on the TV show. And, um, you know, you, you suddenly realize you don't have a minute to yourself. Incredibly exciting, um, just, wonderful really I mean it's euphoric euphoric for me um yeah I mean it was it was life life couldn't have got any better I don't think at that how point. amazing <laughs> did you have to pinch yourself it must have felt it must have felt very yeah. surreal yeah do you know what I still pinch myself about everything that's happened in my life really I, I just think I'm so lucky um uh, yeah I still pinch myself really uh, uh -huh. I'm I'm just you know um yeah <laughs> well, yeah I, mean, I, I don't take anything for granted but it's that yeah, way you know that's a good way to be and, and and your life of course did go on from one success to the next you were of course violinist co-writer and co-producer for Dixie's uh, next album Don't Stand Me Down and right. uh, then you were music director for their Coming to Town tour so you were you were a huge part of that band weren't you I was. Um, yes, the lineup had changed. Um, the music had changed. It was, um, it felt a very natural progression, I think, that, that I became, as I worked more and more with, you know, with the band and, and um, became, um, yes, just, just more involved and, and got to know everybody more. I, I suppose Kevin introduced me into the writing team. Um, my skills from my classical background were, were very useful for Kevin as a musical director. I could audition musicians, write parts out, help Kevin with with some of the practicalities of of the music he was writing. You know, he'd come up with a you know a great tune, and I'd be able to put some chords underneath. Um, you know, it, it was a really good um, musical relationship. And, yeah. and myself, Kevin, and Billy Adams, we were then the core of that um that next album and all our personalities and our skills really work well together as a trio you know we never we never argued we we had the same vision the same dedication and um yeah it was a good it was it was a really good working working relationship right. sounds um, awesome which, which was, was your, which was your favorite which was your personal favorite song from that album uh, this is what she's like. I mean, okay, it was written about me, but <laughs> I did manage to separate my, separate myself about you know the content. Um, but I just think it's, I think it's probably. Um, in fact, funny enough, um, I, I saw I, I've been with Kevin Rowland um, for a few days. We we played at the Commonwealth Games, the closing ceremony. We played Come and Eileen, and we've spent a few days together, um, and we were talking about this very thing and, and I well Kevin said as well this is what she's like is his he thinks it's the best Dexys song and I agree I think it's I think it's the best Dexys song but I think Come and Eileen is a particularly special it, it's, it's like a separate thing I think I think that is a particularly special song as well it's like the, the two I think are, are yeah just so incredible <laughs> Helen Helen O'Hara from Dexy's Midnight Runners what's she like tell us the backstory about that how did that come to be written about you well Kevin um Kevin fell in love with me but I didn't realize when we were on tour um one day after about, I suppose we'd known each other about a year he's sort of um professed his feelings towards me when we were in Ireland actually on tour and I suppose it 
it took me back really because I hadn't really thought about Kevin in, in, in that way at all. Um, but when he started talking to me and, and, and we, I saw him in a different light then. I didn't see him as, you know, the leader of the band. And well, I mean, he was obviously, but I saw another side to him and, and I sort of was fairly, okay, let, you know, I'll go out with you, you know, it's kind of a bit, a bit like that. You know? right. um, I mean, I, you know, there was something about him. It wasn't that, you know, I wasn't just sort of saying yes, but it. But no, but I think, was... I think every, every woman listening to this could certainly relate to the fact that you see a man <laughs> in one way and then when they put it on the line for you, all of a sudden your vision of them changes and you have to make that assessment. Is it like, can I do that? Is can I see him yeah. in this way? So you were obviously able to see him like that and you and you yes. did date, yeah? Yes, that's a very, very good way of putting it, Sandy, actually. There, there is something instinctive, isn't it, that you you know, it, 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 it's yes or no, isn't it? There's, there's no in between. Yeah. And I, I suppose I had to think a little bit more because we were working together. And I, that's and, right. But, but we started dating, yeah, and go, I, I, but fairly soon, you know, I really felt fell for him. You know, I, just, I mean, we really fell in love. You know, it was a really <laughs> amazing um, romance. And then, and then he asked me to move in with him, and and you know, we we started life together. And then he wrote the song about me, and he wrote he wrote another song about me called "Listen to This." And and I mean, I was able to separate separate that when we were working together. Um, yeah, I mean, you sort of had to put put a, put things in a different context, you know. But but it was always there, you know. Um, and we became, you know, we were just great friends as well, and 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 it was wonderful. But but <laughs> it's always about, isn't there? There's things. always, There's always about. About. just before we were going to record um, the album, but it's done. Kevin ended the relationship. I mean, he was he was he couldn't. As I said in my book, he, he couldn't have ended it in a nicer way, but you know, there's no nice way, is there? And I, of course, I was devastated then because it was sort of, I suppose my feelings had grown more and more for him, and he was then beginning to tail off. So it was this awful, mm. awful scenario. I mean, it was it was a desperately sad time. I mean, it, but the thing with Kevin and me is that we we both the, you know, it, it was never even discussed that, that I would leave the group or anything. You know, we it was just we were we both knew how dedicated we were to the album, and and we managed to to continue working together and and separate you know the, our relationship ending with the, the job of making the music and and even though it was difficult for both of us um, and probably more so for me, you know, I'm sure Kevin would agree with that. Um, we managed to. We managed to make the album, and I think, I think there's, you know, the album has that, you know, the, you know, the, the the sort of love and the and the, the listen to this to me, um, the, the 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 song has this darkness about it as well. There's this this extraordinary passion about, you know, Kevin saying that, you know, he he loved me and that he. That I didn't realize that he, you know, he loved me at the time, and then, but he's also ending the relationship. So it's so it's in this incredible three minutes of every emotion, but but also it has an emotion from the rest of the band who are playing. Who we had a lot of difficulties in making the album in in Montreux. It you know it just wasn't gelling, but this song did, and we captured that song. It was the only one we came away with in Montreux, um, and it, everybody was having problems. Our, um, keyboard player Vince was was having mental health problems. He was having a breakdown at the time. We didn't realise that. What year Our was drama, this, Helen? This was 1985. Right. Um, and Crusher, our drummer from America, was having problems himself in that in that it, he was finding the album quite difficult to record. He was finding the Swiss difficult. Um, <laughs> everybody seemed to be having. Um, difficulties of their own <laughs> wow. yeah I mean um, and we were trying to make the, this awesome album and and it nothing was working except that song and it came out in that song and then we had to, had to sort of start again after that with new musicians or so, some new musicians um 
So it took a long time to record the album, but... I mean, you're, the, you're amazing, yeah. though, because despite all of that, you hung in there. It was another couple of years before the band actually broke up. That's right, yeah. Um, I, I think I've always been able to compartmentalise my life and, and work in difficult situations with other often tricky things going on. I'm sure a lot of people have to do that in their lives and... and you can either do it or you can't do it. Well, and... that's right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there are many that would appear to be quite as brave as you during those days. Oh. It would have taken a lot of courage to, to keep putting one foot in front of another in those circumstances, for sure. But why did the band break up in the end? After Don't Stand Me Down, um, it was we toured the album. We'd done a UK tour. Um, we didn't have much support from the record company. Um, we'd spent an awful lot of money making the album. We'd gone against the grain in, in recording a 12-minute single, <laughs> which wasn't the format that BBC would want. And um, our look, you know, we were being criticised for our look, which was um, the Brooks Brothers look. Um, it was going against everything that was happening at the time musically. And so, you know, without promotion and support from the record company, the album um, wasn't wasn't a commercial success. It, obviously, for us, it was it was a creative success, but yeah. commercially, it, it didn't do well. Um, so, was we, it was it an amicable breakup? Yes, it was. We after "Don't Stand Me Down," we were asked by the BBC to rec to make a theme tune. Um, uh, piece of music for a, for a, a very long running successful um, sitcom called Brushstrokes, which uh -huh. which was probably the last thing people would have thought Dexys would have done. And we recorded a single called Because of You, which which was the music for that, which became a top twenty hit actually. Um, um, a, a really lovely song. Um, another song that was sort of written about me actually. <laughs> But it was, aren't you lucky? I can hear all well, of these people in the listening to this going, oh, gosh, why isn't there a song written about me? In fact, I'm thinking the same. Why has no one written a song about me? Well, this was a, a really beautiful song, actually, written about our friendship. So it was a song that was sort of written about our friendship, that we'd come through all this. And it was very light, but it was also very, just, just very beautiful, really. And I, I, but I didn't realise it was written about me until quite recently when I was talking to Kevin about asking him things about my book, uh, you know, questions, just checking some facts with him. Yeah. And he said, you know, that song was about our friendship, Hal, you know. So, and wow. I just didn't realise. So it was only recently that I discovered that. It was really, I didn't put two and two together. So that was really, really lovely. Amazing. Uh, so you, so um, the two of you have remained friends? We have, yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's been ups and downs, obviously, but but um, yeah, we have remained oh, friends. Incredible. I mean, your your it feels like your your musical journey is really only beginning because you went on after Dexys Midnight Runners um, to work with a um, singer called Tanita uh, Tanita Tikaram. Is yes. that how you pronounce it? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, you were also a session player for a whole bunch of people. Um, some of whom we know in, in Graham Parker, who's one of this show's favourites, and Mary Coughlin oh, and the Adventures. Yes, that's right. Um, it, it was actually a lovely um, sort of continuation, really. Um, so after I left Dex's, um, we, we just felt it was a very natural breakup. Um, Kevin went on to record a solo album. I went on to record a couple of solo albums myself, more as a challenge um for myself um than anything really I wasn't expecting to I never really thought I, I or never was looking to become a solo artist it was more a, a musical challenge I suppose and I, I'm really it, it was a wonderful thing to do because I met the extraordinary session player called Nikki Hopkins um who sadly isn't with us anymore but has played on just about everyone's record you know um, the, all the Rolling Stones records and she's a rainbow he played on Jealous Guy he's worked with everyone Graham Parker you know just the kinks almost everyone and it was a, it was a, such a privilege to work with Nikki on, on the album so that that making that album took me to work with Nikki um, and also then to work with um, Tanita for, for a couple of years and 
um, that, that was wonderful because she, she was this 18 year old who was having this incredible success. And for me, it was lovely to have a period of time where I wasn't um, the focal point or anything. I, I, I was, you know, a supporting musician. Um, and and it, was a, it was a lovely uh, position to be in. I really enjoyed working with Tanita. In fact, I'm, I'm working with her again now. I've just done a, a gig in Poland with her. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. And the other one that I, that I noticed you work with is a, a young man by the name of Timothy Burgess, who was oh, the lead singer yeah. of The Charlatans. That's right. I Gosh, mean, you get around, don't you? <laughs> well, that came about. It was absolutely wonderful. In, in the lockdown, um, Tim, Tim Burgess created the listening parties yeah. um, and Dexes were invited to take part. And, and through, through this, um, you know, we were, we were we, um, Tour IA and Don't Stand Me Down were played. And Tim was, you know, we were all sort of messaging each, messaging each other during these parties. And then Tim messaged me, you know, privately and said, um, you know, can I send you my, my solo album? I love the new sky. And would you be interested in recording um, a sort of cutting a direct to vinyl um, song, you know, with me and, and his band, his solo band? And it's like, wow, you know, <laughs> so I'd love to, you know. And, um, and that's how I met Tim. And then from Amazing. there, he asked, he asked me to join his band. And I've been, I've been his solo band, this is. And I've been touring with him and playing festivals like Glastonbury this year. How oh, awesome. And it's... It, it it really is awesome, Sandy. Yeah, it's just yeah. like it's a, such a diverse yeah. career you're enjoying. It's just wonderful. Um, Helen, yeah. what's the what's Tour IA as it should have sounded that's coming out in October? Tell well, us about that. Um, okay, so when when the album was made, I mean, I thought it was terrific. I thought I thought it was great and everything. But Kevin, I didn't realize until later had always felt the mix, the original mix was rather harsh. He loved, you know, there was no criticism of the producers, but because it was sort of how 80s music was sounding then as a finished sort of veneer, if you like. Yeah. He'd, want, he'd at the time, he'd asked the record company, can, can we remix this? Just not change any of the instrumentation or anything. He was very happy with, with, with the, the way it was musically, but the actual sound, they said no there's no money it's going out as it is and so for 40 years kevin wished as it was much different. as he loved it wished it sounded different yeah mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. then with the, the 40th anniversary coming up um he put it to the record company can we remix this you know and they said yes and he asked me and pete schweer who is has been his longtime engineer and co-producer on, on various albums. Um, we got together, we re remixed it. Very subtle changes, really. We didn't, we changed a few little bits and pieces. For example, the beginning of one song called Until I Believe My Soul started with a tin whistle. It had originally started with Jim on the trombone. So we put that back in, right. but we didn't add any new yeah. recording to it. And okay. um, there was just a few little changes, but it was so the actual sound of it. Uh -huh. um, and so, we're anyway, we're, to, so we're going to introduce Tour IA as it should have sounded to a whole new audience. Absolutely. And, it, and it's, I mean, Kevin was, I can't tell you how pleased he, he is and how much it meant to him. I mean, he to finally I remember get it when done. Yeah. It was, I mean, he, he messaged me one day almost in tears. He was so happy. Yeah. with how it was sounding nice. and, and Helen yeah. I just want to before we run out of time because it's it's ticking away here um sure. I'd, I'd just like you to tell my audience all about your book which is called obviously what's she like <laughs> um tell us a little bit about that well it was my mum's idea I mean sadly she 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 died in 2021 of covid sadly but she was she was nearly 101 she, she'd had a pretty good life but she'd said to me well she's had a great life actually and she'd said to me a few years ago Helen you should write your memoir um you know you've got a lot to say uh, you know a woman in the music business and all this sort of thing and I, initially I thought you know what no you know and then I thought about it and I thought yeah she's she's got a she's got a point and I I started just I just started to, to write it, you know, it just sort of started to tumble out, tumble out of me, really. And um, anyway, I'm really, really, really pleased with it because it, it's, 
help me organize my my chaotic life put put it in you know putting it on the page as it were yeah it's helped me get to know myself a lot better so Helen <laughs> in in one sentence how would you sum up what she like oh <laughs> um I'm not sure I can Sandy actually I, I, we'll, gosh, have, to, we'll have to read a, the book will we you'll have to read I the didn't book. mean to put yeah, you on the yeah. spot sorry <laughs> 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 It's, it's a great read. I mean, there's so many fascinating bits that I haven't even got time to go into with you now about what it was Thank like you. to be a woman amongst all those guys in the music industry. <laughs> yeah. Um, must have been just sensational. It was pretty groundbreaking. And, it was. Uh, yeah. you know, you deserve massive congratulations for all your courage and, and all your tenacity. Aww and uh, all that brilliant music that you're making because you're an exceptionally talented musician and having oh, thank you. follow you follow your heart and go with rock and roll instead of going the the classical way it's just fabulous music is all the better for having had you there oh thank you oh, i suppose that that's the thing isn't it i mean listen to your heart you know follow your dreams if you can and um yeah yeah that's 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 how i try to still live my life <laughs> So nice. Aww. Helen Ahara, such an absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Sandy. It's lovely to meet you. And, and thank you for all your research. I can tell you've really, really looked, you know, back at my career. And that's, um, I appreciate that. Wow. Such, such a joy to, uh, to chat about your life. Thank you so much. Thanks, Helen. Sandy. Thanks for joining us today, Helen. Cheers. You thank Bye you. Thanks now. so much. Bye, Bye. now. Bye.